Robert David Steele is one of the most controversial and unique political and economic commentators in the world. His views, analysis, and opinions score him a regular spot on Greg Hunter, SGT Report, and X-22 Spotlight. In this interview, he blows the lid on some very scandalous activities for the first time. Make sure you look at Steele's entire body of work, which includes amazing scoops, at an exclusive report we put together at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Robert. Go there now. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to this Leaders of Tomorrow show special edition. My name is Michelle Holliday. Joining us today is a guest that we have waited for a long time to have on the show, Mr. Robert David Steele. There are so many things that I could say about his extensive body of work in going for the truth, weeding out corrupt politicians, and exposing big scandals. It's so important to really get a handle on Robert's past and current hot topics, and we have bundled them all together in one special epic report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Robert. Robert is a former CIA case officer and CEO of the Earth Intelligence Network with an extraordinary perspective upon the Trump presidency and everything that has been swirling around it ever since he took office. Robert, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh, I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. We are thrilled to have you and excited for this show. Robert, we want to start off with the Fed. We've seen President Trump antagonizing the Federal Reserve, talking about it as being the greatest threat to the economy, mentioning firing the Fed chair, which is unheard of politically, and expressing discontent and dissatisfaction with their performance. Trump is known for firing people whom he deems to be inefficient. He cannot get rid of the Fed, but he can nationalize it, according to some proprietary work that you have put together. But Robert, is that realistic? Well, not only is it realistic, let me point out that the Federal Reserve is A, not federal, not a reserve. It's a criminal organization that represents the banks. Uh, it is also bankrupt. Catherine Austin Fitz and a few other economists that I follow has done some great work. The Federal Reserve is bankrupt. And one of the things the president did recently was stop them from printing any more money. What we have right now is an economic crisis in the United States, and the president is doing everything he can to go toward a gold-backed dollar to recover some of the $43 trillion that have been documented as stolen from the public treasury by the banks with the collaboration of the Federal Reserve. Bottom line is the Federal Reserve president can be fired if the president puts enough pressure on him, uh, just like we took out the IMF chairman. Um, and in addition, the president can hire or can uh, appoint more Federal Reserve board members so that they end up having a Trump majority. President Trump is in control. The Federal Reserve knows that. Excellent. Now, you mentioned that $43 trillion that is missing, unaccounted for, lost. Talk to us about how that could possibly even happen to taxpayer money. Well, when the president said that the system is rigged, he's absolutely right. And he's not only talking about the political system, he's talking about the economic system, the social system, the educational system, even the religious system. Um, this is what we call the deep state. The deep state is not the same as the shadow government. It essentially consists of the banks at the very top uh, and then the corporations and then the politicians who are bought. I've worked with congressmen and senators and staff on the Hill. The standard kickback in the United States of America is 5% of any delivered earmark. And the earmarks are still there, even though they pretend they're not. Furthermore, we don't do true cost economics. So what we have, I've just ordered a book that was written in the 1970s called The High Priests of Waste. The Department of Defense, for example, is 50% waste. This is absolutely documented. And corporations are making huge profits on waste at the same time that they're not being held accountable for delivering massive pieces of crap. The J-35 and the USS Gerald Ford do not work. They're unsupportable. They're unsustainable. They will not win a war. President Trump, God bless him, when he decided to send missiles towards Syria, 
He knew that it was a false flag attack, but he wanted to test our missiles. What he found out was that 33% of Raytheon's missiles did not work. So the next time Raytheon comes to sell me some missiles, I'm going to say, I'm going to take a 33% discount. Is that okay <laughs> with you? All right. The system is, is really, the president is flipping the system. And God bless him for it. We're going to get to the bottom of this. Federal Reserve is in desperate trouble. I expect the president to announce a gold back dollar. I believe he's recovered about $15 trillion so far. And all of that money, my, my esteemed colleague, Cynthia McKinney, was grilling Donald Rumsfeld on the $2.1 trillion that was lost. It wasn't lost. It was handed over. And if you add up interest and all of the other stuff that Catherine Austin Fitz and this other professor out in the West have done, it comes to $43 trillion. The President of the United States, with the proper forensic documentation, has the right to actually take possession of J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Goldman Sachs, and so forth. He could literally do civil forfeiture actions against all of these people for being organized crime. Wow. Do you think he will? No. Why? Because he's an extraordinarily smart man. And if you want to save the house, you don't burn it down. Mm. Uh, most of these indictments that are out there are not going to be opened. They're basically a way of neutralizing the bankers and everybody else that's been enabling them, including corrupt judges, corrupt prosecutors. Matt Tobby wrote an excellent book called The Divide about how we have two legal systems, one for the rich and one for the, one for the poor. Um, what we're going through right now is a cultural revolution. Uh, and in fact, as, as I got ready for you, I'm, I'm writing a new um, volume in my Trump Revolution series on America First. And it's doing an analysis of everything that's broken with America and how Trump can fix it. One of the things the president doesn't know is that the whole government doesn't do true cost economics. He doesn't know that open source everything engineering can create all of the infrastructure he wants at 10 to 20 percent the cost of the existing model that is 50 percent waste and 90 percent profit for the banks and the corporations. So we're, we're moving in the right direction, but the president has a long way to go. You know, Robert, most people are aware by now that no trickle-down effect from the QE programs and all of the monetary policies that the central bank has commenced upon over this past decade have not worked. Investors, rich ones, became far richer, and the middle class, in contrast, has shrunk nearly to the point of extinction. Is the president planning any bottom-up stimulus that you know of where it goes straight <laughs> to the people who require it the most you've been reading my playbook uh <laughs> you've obviously done your homework let me say two things first off the 2001 uh 2008 explosion and the bailout was contrived that was something the banks did deliberately and Paulson, as Secretary of the Treasury, was a co-conspirator. He should be put in jail for doing that, because what we should have done was let the banks collapse and protected the stocks and the public investment. Let me point out that my friend economist Wayne Jett has written a book called The Fruits of Graft that meticulously documents that the Great Depression was contrived by the banks with the collaboration of then-Democratic President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it had three objectives, to destroy the middle class, which was rising in power and demanding political power, to buy up America at depression level prices and, consol and con concentrate wealth further, and third, to capture the U.S. government once and for all. And it succeeded. The Great Depression was contrived by the bankers and the president of the United States and the two political parties were complicit. Fast forward to 2008. Um, what I think is going to happen here is that the president is going to release one to three trillion dollars in a bottom up fashion. Uh, I have been speaking to some people who have been in training and uh, in relationship with the Treasury. This actually started before Trump, but it was started by good people working uh, without Obama realizing it. Um, What's going to happen here is a trillion dollars is going to come into the economy from the bottom up, 
and the people that are spending that money, it's the greatest transfer of wealth in modern history. They are going to be working with two rules. Hire people with good jobs and benefits and don't rent anything. Buy new, always. Uh, I think it's going to change the balance of power in the United States and it's going to destroy the two-party tyranny because what it's going to do is enable all of the people who have been shut out of the political system to realize that Trump is leading massive change. And if I can get him to do the Election Reform Act at the same time, uh, then I think we'll see a completely new America the Beautiful uh, that is going to go way past all of the ugliness that has been imposed on us so far. This is such an extraordinary period of time, and he is up against such fierce, um, corrupt, criminal elements. It's just extraordinary, including the press, which... Oh, the press is bought and paid for. Um, I'm the chief counsel and a commissioner for the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Human Trafficking and Child Sex Abuse. And one of the things that we're coming across is the fact that most congressmen and most bankers and most members of the press and many judges and prosecutors have all been entrapped with pedophilia. They have literally been caught on video doing really terrible, evil things, not always to children, but basically enough to destroy them. Jeffrey Epstein is the poster child for the entrapment mafia that is out there. Jeffrey Epstein is a classic example of how the Mossad, the CIA, the FBI entrap people by basically getting them drunk and drugged up and then putting them into a room that's got video cameras. And at best, it's, it's a babe that's of legal age. At worst, it's a 12-year-old mind-controlled child that's been taught to have rabbit sex so that the video's good. This is what is keeping all of these people under control. Now, let me tell you the good news. I believe that Epstein got a very, very light sentence, essentially a slap on the wrist, because he turned over all of his videos and his entire guest list to the U.S. government. Oh, interesting. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. You know, I want to add a point. Um, I just spoke with um, Dr. David Janda a couple of I love ago. Janda. Absolutely He's great awesome. guy. He mentioned that... He was told specifically in Washington when he re when he asked, he inquired about how what the percentage was of people that were compromised, and it was ninety five percent, which is extraordinary. And my question to you is, how could a good person who runs for political office and then goes up to the hill get compromised in this way? I think that's what most people want to know. I mean. How does this happen? Yeah. Everybody's me, great, and then they move up there, and then they uh, change. Let me break that down into several pieces. The, okay. the the first is the first is that financial compromise is a big part of this. Um, my personal guess is that seventy percent are sexually compromised, and then the rest are financially compromised. Um, second. The way this happens is, you know, Henry Kissinger said power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. People come to Washington. They realize it's a rigged system. By the way, you don't get to Washington. You don't get elected to Congress unless someone has already decided that you're either compromised or compromisable. The one possible exception is Rand Paul. OK, so you look at everybody, including Tulsi Gabbard. She's toast. She's going to be a supporting show in, in uh, Kamala Harris's. Uh, Barack Obama replay. Okay. Kamala Harris is the deep states candidate for 2020. And Elizabeth Warren and uh, uh, Guilliford or whatever from New York is completely compromised. Uh, and Tulsi Gabbard, who really thinks that 9 11 was done by ragheads with box cutters. Uh, Gabbard may not be compromised today. She'll be compromised by tomorrow. Um, all of these people are a joke. Schultz is a Zionist replay. Um, and so Trump is going to win. He's going to win re-election easily. Uh, but I would like him to win re-election with a Congress that is not controlled by one of the two parties, which is why I keep coming back to election reform. Election reform is how you elect independents and libertarians and greens and sandernistas and tea partiers. And that's how you force Congress to make evidence-based decisions rather than pay to play, which is what the president has correctly pointed out, is how Congress does business today. They sell legislation to the highest bidder. 
Talk to us about election reform. Thank you. Um, Right now, today, because of the work of, of the Honorable Dr. Cynthia McKinney, one of the, I mean, she's a goddess to me. Um, she was a six-term congresswoman, and she joined me in my hashtag on rig campaign. Because of what we did, despite fierce opposition, Nancy Pelosi has introduced H.R. 1 for the people, which is an election reform act. This is a fraudulent, deep state election reform act. Among its provisions are the deboldizing of congressional district boundaries and setting the stage for non-citizens to vote. This is Nancy Pelosi's version of election reform. So if Donald Trump wants to pull the rug out from Nancy Pelosi's uh, feet, he will take hashtag unrig the Election Integrity Act with 12 different points, including paper ballots and instant runoff, and he will jam that up her do. Nicely put. <laughs> I was struggling there for a minute. I know you were. <laughs> Thank you for being patient. Of course. Now, Robert, um, shifting gears just a little bit, if you were handed over the keys to lead true reform, what would your plan of action be? Break it down for us. Wow. As president or where? As president. Oy, well, let me say very clearly that I think Donald Trump needs to run for re-election. I'm very, very concerned. There's rumors that he has chosen a business surrogate. John Huntsman name has come up. I think that would be a terrible idea, even though I think Huntsman would be a magnificent Secretary of State. He's the only guy we have that is totally honest and understands China and Russia at the same time. But Trump has to run again. He cannot quit. Donald Trump is not a quitter. I do not want him to quit. I'm absolutely 1,000% supportive of his running for president again. Now, if he does want to be the greatest president ever, then he needs to do some of the things I would do if I were in his shoes, which I am not, and, and if I were advising him, which I am not. Number one is he needs to clear the press out of the White House. There is, that's the most precious real estate on the planet. There is no reason to provide taxpayer funded office space to these scum. We should clear them out of the White House, push them back to the National Press Club and put three things in that space. A grant strategy advisory group, perhaps led by General Tony Zinni, uh, who's one of my heroes, an open source agency to give the president the 96% of decision support that he does not get from the secret intelligence community. And third and last, a Trump studio. He needs a two-way channel. <clears throat> Just today, I'm reading about how Twitter has suspended all these conservative groups, and Google is manipulating searches, and YouTube has digitally assassinated thousands of conservative voices. The president needs to create a new social ecology, but it can't just be one way. It has to be two-way. He needs to connect with 200 million American voters, and he needs a presidential dashboard that allows him to pulse them by location, by demographic, and by issue. And then if he has election reform, he has a Congress that is forced to make evidence-based decisions, not pay to play. No one party should control Congress. At that point, the president can articulate for America a grand strategy that starts with some things like secure the borders and chain migration and this uh, fraudulent birthright citizenship, which if you look closely, I have a shout out for Laura Ingraham. She's got it right. Uh, it was not intended for tourists and illegal aliens and diplomats. Uh, he needs to replenish the aquifers. He needs to give up half of the land that the federal government has taken away from our states and turn that into a new frontier. He needs to distribute the government. He needs to cut the government in half. He needs to close all of our military bases overseas. He needs to make every community self-sufficient. I'm a huge fan of uh, Nicholas uh, Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan and Anti-Fragility and uh, Skin in the Game. And what he talks about is how when you create a massive complex infrastructure or, or structure that's governed from the top down, it becomes a house of cards. It's too easy to wreck it. But if you distribute power, if you distribute resources, 
then every state, every community is self-sufficient. Um, and I'm huge on that. Uh, my bottom line is that Donald Trump has done a fantastic job of dealing with the 1%. He has not connected with the 99% and empowered the 99%. And that's the gift that I would give to him if he were to listen. That's an extraordinary idea to have his own studio. It's where he can connect with the people, skip the news, skip them, because he's so brilliant when he's out amongst people giving speeches, whether it's supporting other candidates or whatever. He's so brilliant. But then when he gets into that sort of, I don't know, spirit sucking <laughs> realm yes. with all yes. of those journalists around him and attacking him. Well, not just the journalists, his own staff are betraying him. I've got a lovely book review essay that, that reviews about seven books and I've written individual reviews on these books. And essentially Donald Trump is surrounded by traitors. And these books have made it clear that Jared Kushner, uh, Jared Kushner destroyed Trump's first year. He threw away the 12 volumes of transition team planning that Governor Christie oversaw just because Jared Kushner hated Governor Christie. So Donald Trump began government on day one without those 12 volumes. He also, because he, he believed that he shouldn't anticipate winning, and so he made no preparations for staffing the White House, that allowed the Office of uh, Presidential Personnel to be hijacked by the Republican National Council, which is not his friend. Republican National Committee. Rents Priebus has never been uh, Donald Trump's friend. He's always been a best pal of Paul Ryan and Scott Walker and the Republican Mafia. So even Donald Trump's secretary was spying on him for the Republican National Committee. Okay, and that's in the latest book by uh, Cliff Sims, uh, Team of Vipers. Um, so I really think that Trump has accomplished one third of what he could have accomplished if he had allowed Governor Christie to do his job and if he had not corrupted the White House with his first daughter and Jared Kushner. Those two proved to be toxic in combination with Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway, who is known as now as the leaker in chief, who is constantly bad mouthing the president to the press. Donald Trump basically set himself up for not failure, because he is a force of nature. I mean, he is epic. Not only epic on the trail, but Jack Welch is quoted in Cliff Sims' book. Welch came out of a meeting with Trump, and he said, say what you want about him. That is the first guy I've ever talked to that understands business. He's not a politician. God bless Donald Trump. Trump needs to be empowered. And the best way to empower Trump is to clean the White House out and start over. Excellent. Excellent. And, you know, it just illustrates that he's a force of nature. He's an incredible man. He's an incredible businessman. We are blessed beyond words to have him in that office. However, he can't do this alone. And I think our country, those who support him and see what's going on, really need to realize this instead of, oh, President Trump will take care of it. Oh, I hope he takes care of it. This kind of, We have to realize this guy seems like Superman, but he really needs the rest of us, right? I agree with you completely. There's, there's too much complacency in America. And if I, if I could make one wish right now, it's that you can get this video to Lou Dobbs. Because Lou Dobbs is the one guy that Donald Trump listens to. Uh, and I would love for Lou Dobbs to understand these ideas. Uh, because you have to run America the way you would run a business, not a crime family. And right now it's being run as a crime family and everything the president is doing is, is, uh, is effective in a small way. Uh, Washington Examiner did a list of 200 successes, but there's also a report card on Trump that I publish every once in a while. One third green, one third yellow, one third red. And we can make it all green if we can give Donald Trump the staff and the support that he needs. Exactly. If we can all come together and make sure that it's not just one person that's a patriot well, in our company and we're all following him, we've got to all Congress, step up. Congress needs to be flushed down the toilet, including most of the rhinos, Republicans in name only. Uh, and this is why election reform, hashtag unrig, becomes Donald Trump's uh, magic sauce. If he does election reform, he will go from 27%, which is the, the number of eligible voters that elected him, 
It'll go from 27% to no less than 50%, perhaps even as much as 70%. If he puts libertarians and greens and constitutional party and, uh, and independents, I'd love for Lisa Montgomery Kennedy to run uh, from Fox Business as she's an independent. Um, he needs to put these people into power and he needs to gut the, the two-party, I have this horrible cartoon which shows an eagle with a joker face and a red wing and a blue wing, and it's claws in Capitol Hill. It says one bird, two wings, same crap. That's what we have today. We have got to clean out the White House, and we have got to clean out Congress, and President Trump has the power to do both within 90 days. Wow. I really, I really hope as I'm sure you do too, that this comes to pass. Um, despite the fact it's burning down the house, we're not going to have a house anyway if we continue this way. I mean, depending, you know, 20 years from now, once President Trump is gone, and um, if this doesn't happen now, many of the people coming up aren't even aware. They aren't even aware of, I, I talked to a lot of people about Venezuela, so many people that are coming up into voting power have no clue about Venezuela and are all about socialism without a clue of what's going to happen. And they would not do that if they knew. You're right. And, and this has been very deliberate. We've lost an entire generation, perhaps two, to very deliberately contrived deep, deep state uh, campaign plans in our schools, the media, Hollywood, television, games, I follow John Rappaport, who's written a wonderful series on The Matrix, and I publish him at phibetaiota.net every once in a while. And he's really looking at how we have an entire generation that has forgotten or never learned how to think. They can't do logical arguments. They can't do library research. In fact, anytime one of my YouTubes is published, I get all these morons saying, once CIA, always CIA. And it turns out they don't read. Because if they read, they would know that I've written nine books critical of CIA, two of them with forwards by senators that were trying to reform CIA. So these people don't read. They don't think. Um, they accept um, memes as if they were the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I really believe that President Trump ultimately is going to have to become the great educator. And that's why I designed the Trump studio so that it wouldn't just be the president doing fireside chats but we would have all assistant secretaries, we would have experts from around America come in, and we would ultimately create a massive library of seven minute videos on everything, to include, as the one I just looked at, how to clean the carburetor on my snowplow. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's a, that is a brilliant idea. That is absolutely brilliant because he needs to get to the people and he needs to click into their brain. And if he can do it when they're outside of their peer pressure groups, I really believe that people will start to turn around and see, you know, we don't want our country to become a poor third world nation. No one wants that. They just don't realize that socialism does exist. Exactly. Well, it's not just socialism. It's things like using up all of our water. Uh, the aquifers are going down 10 meters a year. I mean, Texas has 30 towns that are running out of water. They're going to hiccup one day and not be able to flush their toilets or run the tap water. Okay. So there are a lot of strategic things that are happening across this country to include disease and poverty and crime and drugs, the opioid crisis. By the way, the opioid crisis was manufactured by the banks and the pharmaceuticals. Um, so I, I think the president is, is lacking right now. He has an intelligence community that stinks, okay? I'm a former spy. I can say this. Uh, and Bill Binney from NSA is my very good colleague. We have lunch once a week. We've agreed that 70% of the secret intelligence community should be burned to the ground, up to 70%. And the other 30% from each agency should be consolidated under, under Gina Haspel in an expanded CIA. Then you have an open source agency over here that does intelligence for the public, the president, and, and, and so forth. The president is working with half, let's put this in golf cart terms. The president's uh, bag of golf clubs is half empty. Okay, it's like he's trying to play president with a nine iron, a putter, and, and one wood. He doesn't have all the tools that he can and should be using. You know, it's so extraordinary that this whole situation has been orchestrated, not just from the pharmaceutical side, 
you know, the diseases and the expense and the money printing side and the media side and the politician side and uh, Hollywood, you mentioned, the whole thing has been orchestrated in such a, um, it's almost, it, it's a setup. Satanic yeah. is the word you're looking I for. I am looking for it. I didn't want to say it. It's, just, it's like the devil has arrived. The devil Robert. has been here for a very long time. Uh, and one of the problems that we have is that the Christian evangelicals have basically been bribed and brainwashed by the Zionists. The Zionists are not the Jews. Zionism is the criminal element that runs Israel and that has subordinated and, and s sabotaged U.S. government. We have nine million decent Jews in America who are not the problem. The power of Israel in the United States is not based on these lovely Jewish voters. In fact, Haratz, who's the smartest journal in Israel, has asked the question in a headline, is it time for all Jews to boycott Israel? Okay, now we have a law before the Senate of the United States right now that makes it a felony to criticize Israel. It would make, if passed, which I don't think it will be, but if passed, this law would make it a felony for anyone to say they want to boycott Israel. And we have 25 states in the United States of America that will not give you a state job and will not allow you to have a state contract unless you sign a loyalty oath to Israel that says, I have never boycotted Israel, I will never boycott Israel. At phibateiota.net, I have a list of 30 Zionist strikes. Again, Zionism is not Judaism. And what we have here in the United States, when the director of national intelligence goes to Congress and lies to them and says that China, Iran, and Russia are trying to influence the U.S. election, not only is that an outright lie, at most, China, Russia, and uh, Iran spent perhaps $6.5 million. The Zionists and the two parties and Sheldon Adelson and Michael Bloomberg and Tom Steyer and all these other people, they spent $6.5 billion. $6.5 billion for the Zionists and their domestic partners to influence elections versus $6.5 million for China, Iran, and Russia. The Director of National Intelligence is lying to Congress, and he is failing to say the real threat to America is the Zionist parasite that's buried within our economy, our government, and our society. And I have to say this, I'm one of the first people to successfully articulate the extremely important difference between Zionism and Judaism. This is not anti-Semitic. This is counterintelligence threat assessment. I hope that's okay for you. You can always cut it out if you don't like it. No, we, we wanna know. We wanna know your perspective on things. Um, going back, to the gold standard, you mentioned it, from your perspective. Do you feel that the United States dollar could be backed by gold again one day? Oh my goodness, I'm really impressed. You've actually read into this, this is excellent. <laughs> the president has as one of his top economic advisors, a woman named Judy who is the top person in the United States of America on gold-backed currency. There is no question in my mind, not only based on watching the president, but on stuff I'm hearing from China and Russia, the United States of America will be on a gold-backed currency before 2020. Oh, wow. That is extraordinary news. Now, Robert, shifting gears once again, are you concerned with nuclear threat, either domestically or abroad? The short answer is no. 9-11 uh, was a nuclear event. There was a form of nuclear power used to vaporize the Twin Towers. And my memoranda for the president were delivered to the president on the 8th of August of this past year. I know he's read them. I know his family has read them. Some of his senior advisors have read them. He has said the time is not right to expose the 9-11 perpetrators. But that was one of his campaign promises. And your listeners can find the memoranda that went to the president at tinyurl.com forward slash 911 POTUS, P O T U S. Um, nuclear, nuclear is a threat primarily in the radiological sense. In other words, someone could come and drop some radiological material and literally close off an entire portion of a city for decades. Okay, so it's out there. And the United States of America has not done a good job of controlling its nuclear materials, never mind that Hillary Clinton sold Uranium One to Russia. 
Apart from that, we have all kinds of nuclear weapons that have not been accounted for. We have nuclear all across hospitals and so forth. There are lots of ways to do damage with nuclear. But at the higher strategic level, the biggest threat to peace is the 200 nuclear bombs in Israel that the American taxpayer has paid for. It's not Iran, which is using nuclear for normal energy purposes. It's not Pakistan, which has its own nuclear power. It's not even Saudi Arabia, and it's not North Korea. China has told North Korea in no uncertain terms, you will denuclearize and become like South Korea, prosperous. And the whole thing, I was called an idiot, a lunatic, when I wrote my article on the 4th of March that said that the Koreas are going to unite and denuclearize and demilitarize. I got that straight from the princess in Japan, who is the royal family liaison to the North Koreans. This is not what CNN and Fox News and others want to talk about, because they want to raise the nuclear uh, boogeyman, because that's how the military industrial complex stays in business. The president knows all of this. And I have to say, the president is going to earn the Nobel Peace Prize. According to the terms of Alfred Nobel's will, which have been completely dishonored going all the way back to Kissinger, the will says that the Nobel Peace Prize is for the person who has done the person, not the organization, the person who has done the most to demilitarize the world in the past year. Every Nobel Peace Prize, including Obama's, is absolute, utter political bullshit, okay? Donald Trump working with Xi and Putin actually has the power to earn that Nobel Peace Prize in the next four years, and he will do it by denuclearizing the Middle East and denuclearizing the Koreas. Uh, and I think he's on a path. I believe that we will see the denuclearization of Israel and Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, in the next 10 years. It's beautiful news. That combined with your prediction of being on the gold standard by 2020 is outstanding. <laughs> I hope. Robert, this has been an amazing interview. Please tell everyone how they can follow your work. I think the easiest thing is just look up Robert David Steele. RobertDavidSteele.com is my personal website. The blog, phibetaiota.net, is free with no advertising. And, of course, I would be glad to have donations at paypal.me forward slash earthintel. And if you do make a donation, I'll send you a personal email and answer any question you've got. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. Well, God bless you. You were prepared, and I'm deeply impressed by what you've done. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's an honor to hear you say that. Mr. Robert David Steele, whose past and present hot topics are covered in our exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Robert. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. We also released an interview with silver expert David Morgan of The Morgan Report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Morgan for his best predictions. Huge interview with John Rubino of Dollar Collapse, a Gerald Salente explosive interview, including his key ideas at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Salente. This year, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell made his obligatory visit to Capitol Hill where he spoke to senators and representatives about monetary policy. And, of course, really this amounts to just a, a press conference for uh, Democrats and Republicans to either talk up the economy or talk down the economy, depending on who's got the White House. Trump is the president, so you have a lot of Democrats trying to talk about why the economy is actually weak and trying to get – the Fed chairman to say something negative about the economy or negative about President Trump. And then, of course, you have the Republicans trying to get Powell to validate how great the economy is and how, uh, you know, Trump's policies are helping the economy. And, you know, the biggest problem with all this is that the, the biggest promoters of how great the economy is uh, are the Republicans, right? These are supposedly the defenders of capitalism, uh, and they're saying everything is great, everything is booming. And you have the Democrats, particularly the Democratic Socialists, who are saying that there are a lot of problems, and the Republicans are saying that these problems don't exist. And unfortunately, when it hits the fan, when we end up in a recession, and I've been making this point over and over again, 
but capitalism is going to be thoroughly discredited because the people who advocate it were oblivious to the problems. They said everything was fine, and now the socialists are going to appear to be the ones that had it right, even though they were right for the wrong reasons. I mean, they have no idea uh, why the economy is screwed up, and their plans to solve the problem will just screw it up even more, but the voters aren't going to know that. They're going to see, oh, these Republicans who talk about capitalism, they were wrong. They didn't realize what a mess it was. Here it's these democratic socialists. They understood. They knew there was a problem. So, you know, let's vote for them because, you know, they must know the solution if they understood the problem. Well, they didn't understand the problem. That was the point. But at least they admitted there was a problem. The Republicans denied there were any problems at all. I mean, all they talked about was this booming economy, this unprecedented economy. And so when this thing, you know, goes into recession, they own that. There's no way to walk that back. And they're going to make it very easy for the socialists to come into power because they're going to be the ones that have the credibility, even though they don't deserve any of it. They're going to get it. And then we're going to adopt these policies. But, you know, one thing about the fact that Powell was uh, testifying was that we got a lot of talk on the financial uh, you know, television shows about the Fed, about the economy, about Powell, you know, centered around the testimony, which, of course, they run live and they show the Q&A, which is usually the more interesting than the prepared testimony. In fact, I was excited because I thought uh, AOC, uh, the bartender, because she is on the House Financial Services Committee, which is chaired by Maxine Waters. She's on that committee. So I was hoping that she was going to be there to ask a question. Uh, I thought that would be very comical, but she w- she wasn't up there. I mean, I, you know, obviously the whole committee doesn't get to ask questions. I'm not really sure how they pick who asks questions, but my guess is they wanted to muzzle her. They probably didn't want to make her look even more foolish than she already is. In fact, Yesterday, when the Senate was uh, talking to Powell, the subject of MMT, modern monetary theory, did in fact come up. And I'm going to speak about that later in the podcast when I really get into some of the specific points uh, that were made uh, by Powell in response to to the Q&A. But right now, I just kind of want to talk a little bit again about the media coverage of this spectacle. And to me, when I sit back and I watch Uh, All of these talking heads um, discussing the economy and uh, the Federal Reserve. To me, it kind of reminds me of, you know, looking at a bunch of five-year-olds having a conversation about Santa Claus and how it is that he manages to, you know, deliver all these these uh, presents in in just one day, and they you know they come up with ways that he does it. Of course, you know it's it's very uh, entertaining uh, to watch uh, that type of discussion, and it's all a bunch of nonsense. But it's very cute, you know, the way their minds work and the way they try to figure this out. And that's kind of you know while I'm watching uh, these uh, people discuss the economy and the Fed, I mean that's what to me that's what I'm watching, except. You know, it's not that comical. It's it's kind of more sad and it's not cute at all because they're not five years old. I mean, these are adults who are really discussing topics that they know nothing about. 